Good afternoon, guys. And we are here to discuss about patient comfort and safety. So let's start. So before we will take care of our patients, we need to take care of ourselves first. So we need to take note what is body mechanics. Body mechanics, it's vital to prevent back pain. As I've told you uh, last, last discussion in our positioning and transferring. So what is body mechanics? Body mechanics, it is the use of one's body to produce motion that is safe, energy conserving, and efficient. Safe in a way that you will prevent back pain. Energy conserving, you need to do one task at the same side of the bed after going to the other side. And you should, it, it should be efficient. All of which allows a person to maintain a balance and control. So let's take a look what are the principles of body mechanics. So first, you should remain close to the object. Don't lift any objects which is far from you because it will uh, make your back painful. So another principle of body mechanics is widen your base of support. You should uh, you should uh, position your feet uh, far apart so you should have the base of support. And always tighten your abdominal muscles. Don't put any strain on your back or any part of your body but in your abdominal muscles. In this way also, you can develop your muscles which uh, uh, develop your abdominal muscles so you should decrease your uh, big belly. Then bend your knees and keep your back straight. Okay, In lifting an object, you should bend your knees, not your back. I will repeat, you should bend your knees, not your back. Uh, as we are seeing most of the people or most of the nurses or nursing practitioners that uh, almost uh, most of them, they are bending their back instead of their knees. That's why they are, they are having this uh, back pain. So plan your lift and ask for help. Okay, you can, if you cannot leave the patient or an object, don't be a hero. You, you call someone to help you. So what are the difference among incident, accident, and hazard? So accident, it is an unfortunate incident that happens unexpectedly and unintentionally uh, typically resulting in damage or injury. So accident, it is an unfortunate incident. It is a type of incident that can result in damage or injury. So what is what are the example of this fall? Incident, it is an any event that has harm or could harm a patient, resident, visitors, or staff member. So if you have a broken piles, okay, in the floor of the hospital, it can be, and when someone fall because of this, uh, it can be considered as incident. That's why the manager uh, is making incident report if someone uh, fell because of the broken tiles. Hazards. So what do you mean by hazards? Hazards, it is anything in the person's setting that may cause injury or illness. Okay? It is anything in the person's setting that may cause injury or illness. So fall, it is defined as an event which results in a person coming to rest inadvertently on the ground or floor or other lower level. As I've told you before that Paul, it is a mortal scene in the hospital. No patient is allowed to have fall because it is a type of negligence. All, all, 
or malpractice. So we should take care, uh, we should always make sure that the side rails is up when we are doing procedures. So what are the risk factors of fall? We have the person and the care setting. Okay, so in the person, we have a lot. You can check on your module. We have a lot of risk factors for fall, okay, in the personal side. And we have another more risk factors uh, in the care setting or in the hospital. So how we will prevent fall? So of course, we need to meet their basic needs. Some patients, they need fluid, okay? That's why they are, they are, they fell down because they are, they want to drink and the water, it's not there. So suddenly they fall. Then some patients, they want to pass urine or urinate or defecate, but uh, they cannot because they have this injury. And if there is no nursing assistant or nurse, okay, suddenly they will uh, stand and then it will cause them to fall. So always meet their basic needs. Fluid needs are met. Eyeglasses and hearing aids are worn as needed. Glasses are not worn when up and about. Tasks are explained before and while performing them. So any procedure that you are doing to your patient, make sure that you explain it thoroughly. Help is given with the elimination needs, okay? How you will help the patient make sure that the, the bedpan and the urinal is always available if the patient asks for it. A warm drink or soft lights or back massage is used to calm the person who is agitated. Okay, some patients, they are falling because they are agitated and confused. They are out of their mind. So they will jump out of the bed and then they will fall. So this uh, thing, warm drinks and soft lights or back massage will calm that person. Barriers are used to prevent wandering. What are those barriers? Barriers, it can, uh, it, it is also called as restraint, okay? For those patients who have severe confusion and agitation, they are restraining the patient. They are putting tie on the hands or uh, in, on the feet. So it can, they can be also put on chemical restraint, like they are giving medicine so to make uh, the patient calm. The person is properly positioned when in bed or chair or wheelchair. So use pillow wedge and seats as a nurse and care direct. Correct procedures are used for transfers. That's why we are practicing and we uh, discuss how to transfer patients because if we don't know how to transfer patients, of course, uh, there will be a risk that the patient might fall. Correct procedures, uh, the person is involved in meaningful activities. And exercise programs are followed. They help improve balance, strength, walking, and physical function. In the bathroom and shower tubs, always make sure that the patient have, patients have non-sleep surfaces or non-sleep bath mats. If you remembered how to transfer patient from bed to wheelchair, okay, I told you to put non-sleep, sleep, non-sleep uh, or non-skid uh, socks or slippers or shoes to the patient. So if the patient will stand, there will be no risk of fall. There should be a grab bars in the shower rooms, but rooms have grab bars, shower chairs are used. So we have shower chairs, like it's a wheeled uh, commode chair. Safety measures for bathtubs and showers are followed. Uh, call bell is not only located in the patient's bedside, but also it is situated also in the patient's uh, bathroom. So anytime the patient needs you or needs help, he should, uh, he, he will only uh, 
press the call bell so uh, help can come. Carpeting is wall to wall or top down. It should be clean, scattered free. There is no rugs because it can cause fall also. Uh, floor covers are one color because bold colors might cause dizziness that can lead to uh, fall, especially to older person. Uh, floor should be free from clutter and spills. That's why if the cleaner is uh, uh, if the cleaner is uh, cleaning the floor, they are putting a, um, a signboard that the, the floor is wet. So make sure to always put the sign, floor sign but for wet area to prevent fall. Electrical and extension cords are out of the way, okay? Because this can lead also to fall. Furniture is placed for easy movement. Furniture is kept in place. Arms have armrests. A phone lamp and personal belongings are within the patient's reach. So the phone, all the personal belongings, the call bells, it should be placed on the person's reach. If the person is having right-sided weakness, you should place it on the opposite side. The bed is in the correct height for the person. The bed should be in the lowest horizontal position as possible after doing any procedure. So if fall happen, there will be less risk or tendency or less injury for the patient because it is short uh, with only low uh, position. Make sure that the bed rails are always up after doing any procedures. Wheelchairs, walkers, canes, and crutches fit properly. If there's any uh, problem with these assistive devices, it needs to be repaired because this is used by the patients. Lightning is very important for the patient uh, also because especially for older people, if uh, they have visual impairment already, there will be tendency that they might fall. Night lights are in, in the bedroom hallways and bathroom. So if you will notice that all hospitals, they have night lights, they will just close the main lights and they will open the night lights if the patient want to sleep. Okay, this will allow uh, the patient to, to still uh, see the floor if they are going to washroom. Signal lights and alarm should be put on the side of the patient, which is, which is working. Color-coded alerts are used to warn of a fall risk, okay? So if you notice if there is a red band for the patient or pink band for the patient, it means that the patient is high risk for fall. Usually older patient is high risk for fall. Those patients who is taking medication which cause dizziness is high risk for fall. Those patients who had seizure, those patient, patient who has previous history of fall, they are high risk of fall. And the, you will notice that they have pink band. The person is checked often. This may be every 15 minutes or required by the care plan. Frequent checks are made on the persons with poor judgment or memory. So who's this? Those patients with Alzheimer's, those patients with uh, dementia, those patients with delirium. So they should be checked uh, more often because they have tendency to fall or jump out of the bed. This type of person should be close on the nurse's station or they 
uh, closest to the nurse's station and they should not be put in a private room because it's difficult to see them. Okay, so we finished the fall. Now uh, let's discuss the fire and safety. So as nursing assistant, if you will have orientation in one hospital, okay, you will be oriented about the fire and safety because fire can happen anytime. Remember that the hospital has numerous amount of oxygen that can cause fire. So we should be aware of what are the things and what are our, our responses in case there will be fire. So what are the elements or three elements of a fire? So if you have oxygen, heat, and fuel, you can create fire. So we have different types of fire. We have type A, which is usually from wood, paper, clothes, leaves, and grass. So method of extinguishing this type of fire is water. Uh, type B fire, these are liquids like cooking oil, grease, gasoline. So method of extinguishing is do not try to put these fires out with water. Use a fire extinguisher that is specific to an electrical fire instead of baking soda, or it can be using a fire extinguisher made for type B. We have also type C fire, which is the electrical fire. Okay, attempting to put an electrical fire out with water can result in shock or electrocution. So we all know that. Use a fire extinguisher that is specific to an electric fire instead. So if you will be in the hospital, you will be oriented what type of uh, extinguisher you can use for a specific type of fire. So how we will prevent fire? Of course, we need to supervise not only our patients, but also the relatives and orient them that it's not allowed to smoke in the hospital premises. We have hospital, uh, we have smoking uh, areas outside the hospital. Do not allow any patients or residents to smoke. Do not provide patients or residents who, who are receiving oxygen therapy with wool or mohair blankets because they can ignite and it can cause fire. If smoking is permitted in the facility, make sure that all smoking occurs only in designated smoking areas. Okay, you will, uh, if you will be assigned in a psychiatric ward, guys, the, this ward allows smoking, of, smoking for the patients. Why? Because it can be a diversional activities for those psychiatric patients, but other wards, they are not allowing it. Uh, so they have designated smoking areas inside the ward so the patients can, uh, uh, can, can smoke. Keep smoking materials, lighters, and matches in place where children and confused patients or residents cannot reach them. Keep all electrical equipment in good working condition. Handle flammable uh, substances safely and clean up any spills immediately. So there are times that there will be biohazards or there will be leaks, uh, leaks, electrical leaks or tubes, uh, water leaks. So immediately the, the technician needs to fix this because it can cause fire. Report any malfunctioning smoke detectors immediately. Usually every six months, they are checking the, if, if the smoke detectors is working and, it's, and the battery should be changed every six months. Investigate smoke or smells of anything burning promptly. Okay, some patients, they are so hard-headed. So they are smoking in the bathroom. So if this, if this happened, uh, confront the patient and tell them the risk of smoking inside the hospital. Be familiar with your facility's fire and safety policy. So as I've told you, once you have orientation in one hospital, they will also orient you in the safety uh, policies regarding fire. 
in all the fire exits. So what are the things that we need to do if there will be fire? Just always remember the acronym RACE and PASS. RACE and PASS. So first, RACE. R in the RACE is remove or rescue. So remove the patients from the uh, place where there is fire. So any patients or residents who are in an immediate danger to safety. So who we will escort first? My question. Who we will escort first? Those patients who is non-ambulatory or those patients who is ambulatory? Okay, who we will rescue first? So what's the answer? The answer is we need to rescue those patient which is ambulatory. Okay, so are you surprised that we will rescue the ambulatory? Yes, because we need to rescue them first so they can help you to rescue the non-ambulatory ones. Next, activate the alarm. So in all hospitals, there will be an alarm if there is fire. Okay, activate the alarm. Then C for contain the fire. E is for extinguish the fire. So how you will contain the fire, make sure to close all the doors and windows so the fire will not spread. It will be contained in one area. So what do we mean by PASS? PASS is a step-by-step -step guide in how we will extinguish the fire. So P is for pull the safety pin, okay? A for aim for the nozzle. S is for squeeze the lever. And another S is sweep back and forth. So these are the things we need to remember for fire, race and pass. Next topic is restraint. Restraint, if you are working in the hospital, it's not uh, preventable that you will see patients who is tied, who is restrained. Because some patients, they are confused. They are, what they're calling this, confused, agitated. So they need to be restrained. Uh, restraint is a reminder device are used to restrict the person's freedom of movement or to prevent a person from reaching parts of his body. We have two types of restraint. Okay? First is the physical. Physical means those restraint that we are putting in one's body. We have the vest restraint, the jacket, the wrist, the meat, lap, lap body, and chair with the table. We have also chemical restraint. Chemical restraint are those restraint which is a medicine, okay? Which is only the doctor and the nurses are giving, okay? We cannot put the restraint if we want only. There are some indications for restraint. First, there will be it is indicated for risk for falling, but cannot remember to call for help before attempting to get up. For those patients who is confused, okay, and jumping out of the bed, out of their mind, you need to restrain them. Then risk for wandering away from the facility because of dementia or Alzheimer's. Attempts to remove or pull out tubing necessary for medical treatment. Okay, for example, he has NG tube. He has peg, he has endotracheal tube for breathing, okay? Because he is out of his mind, low oxygen level in the brain. That's why he is out of uh, his mind. So he can pull the tube. So you can tie that patient. Has overdose or alcohol on alcohol or medications and is demonstrating combative behavior due to withdrawal symptoms or in suicide precautions. You will notice those patients, there's a lot of patients who are uh, with alcohol overdose or alcohol withdrawal. After 24 to 48 hours of taking alcohol, continuously taking alcohol, they will have alcohol withdrawal. 
And after that, at first, they are so quiet. And after 48 hours, they will be combative and they will uh, punch you, they will kick you and whatsoever. So they are so dangerous. So restraint is indicated. What are the complications of restraint? First, strangulation. Strangulation, it is cutting off of the person's air supply. Okay, they can use the restraint to strangulate themselves. There will be also bruises, nerve damage, and skin abrasions. If the restraint are so tight, it can cause this problem. Then permanent tissue damage and broken bones and other serious injuries. Complications also are those complications that I've discussed to from immobility. Okay, we have pneumonia, pressure ulcer, blood clots, incontinence, and mental effects. Why? Because this time, if the patient is restrained, there uh, the patient is immobile. The patient is not moving. That's why all the complications is the same with the complications I discuss in the immobility. So what are the guidelines in using restraints? Do not use a restraint without a written doctor's order, okay? Do not use a restraint. You should make sure that there's a doctor's order. It is a legal uh, issue. That's why we need to secure a doctor's order. Never use a restraint to punish a patient. If you want the patient to shut up their mouth, then you want to put the restraint. It's not. Uh, it's not uh, allowed. There are some indications that we already discussed, okay, indications that need to be considered only to put the restraint. Use the least restrictive restraint for the least amount of time, okay? So every two hours, okay, you need to release this restraint so to make sure that there will be no nerve damage or injury on the person's part of the body restraint. Follow the manufacturer's instructions, nurse's direction, and facility policy for applying restraints. Use a restraint that is correct size in a good condition. Use commercial restraints. If there will be, uh, like in the Philippines, there is no available commercial restraint. So what we are using is only bed sheets and pillowcase. It's not allowed because it is more tight. And there's no soft part on this uh sheet so the commercial restraint there is a soft part so it's much uh safer so you need to use the commercial ones restraints are always applied over clothing pajama or a gown restraints are tied in a simple quick release knot okay don't tie your patient as if that you will not remove the tie okay you need to Ribbon only the tie to make sure that it's released easily. Ensure that you have enough help when applying a restraint. Check on the restraint person every 15 minutes to make sure that the feeling and blood flow are normal in any restraint. So you just observe the site where you restrain every 15 minutes if it's not developing complications and you need to release the restraint every two hours. Make sure wheelchair wheels are locked in the front swivel wheels are facing forward when the person is restrained in the wheelchair. Side rails should always be raised when a person is restrained in the bed. Don't put the restraint on the side rails because if you will uh, move the side rails up or down, okay, it will pull the hand or the limbs of the patients, uh, which is restrained. Completely remove the restraint every two hours. Remove record any card given to restrained person, okay? Always you are recording it every two hours. Use restraint only if you have been properly trained in their use because this is a legal condition. That's why you need, I mean, legal issue. So you should be careful in applying restraint. So this is our topic. So we finished the topic, safety. So next topic is comfort.